Let's talk about one of the most important and successful science fiction and fantasy stories, The Paper Menagerie, and let's blow some life into it today. Oh, I see what you did there. That's funny. <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. I am Crypto. And <laughs> I know what you did there. And as a part <laughs> of Deanie's science fiction fantasy, the SFF weekly short stories that she typically does, she's allowed us to participate in this week. We've been seeing some good stuff from her channel. I recommend checking it out below. But what we're going to do is we're going to read the story and then answer those prompts. So if you'd like to join along at home, we'd encourage you guys to read the story because holy cow, is this a good one. Now, The Paper Menagerie is a 2011 fantasy magical realism short story by Ken Liu, first published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. But with that said, it is the first ever work of fiction to win all three SF major awards, the Hugo, the Nebula, and the World Fantasy Award. That's yeah, that's incredible. impressive. I mean, if you did, if he did just this story and did nothing else the rest of his writing career, I mean, you're a legend right there. Well, he, and he's won multiple awards. Like, he didn't just stop right there. This, he's pretty he's pretty incredible. Now, if you want to read, you can read for free. We're going to put a link in the description below. In terms of my reaction, I can't, I can't summarize this more than just saying that I cried when I read it. I did. Yeah, when I was, I listened to it on my drive. And as soon as I was done, uh, I did the dictation audio text thing to you. And uh, you were like, I cried. I'm crying. And I was like, oh, wow, very, very emotional for you. Let's jump into plot. This is a good example of where they time skip around a little bit. I'm going to rearrange it just a little bit. But in the spring of 1973, a dad was slipping through a catalog and basically is shopping for a wife and spots a Chinese woman that he basically says that he wants to marry. So he flies over there. And when he meets her, she doesn't speak English, doesn't dance. She, none of the things that she was advertised to be, but he still... Hap hires like a, a the waitress pays her to translate so that he can talk to her uh they eventually get up you know get married he brings her back to connecticut and our narrator a small boy named jack and one of his earliest memories at the age of three where he's kind of inconsolable he's crying and his dad gives up and kind of walks away and his mom brings him into the other room and makes him little origami animals and she kind of blows blows them up blows you know a little tiger and it kind of consoles the little boy where he was otherwise upset as jack grows older and turns into a teenager he starts to have american friends and neighbors he starts to see racism and he starts to kind of reject his his heritage at least the asian side what that makes him different from other boys and uh, it kind of breaks his mom's heart he, he puts the origami away in the attic you know, she tries to change to American cooking. She tries to hug him and he's like, no, why don't you speak the language? You, you know, you're just, you're just different. Uh, eventually a tragedy hits the family and his mom passes away. And her last wish is for him to open up this origami on a, a Chinese holiday to remember the dead. And uh, he, he kind of does that and he finds some writing on the inside of these animals. His mom had written in Chinese. So he goes down to an area and starts asking some, some people that look Asian if, if they can translate for him. Can, can you read to me what my mom wrote to me in this origami? And they read the backstory about how she grew up as a peasant. Her mom ate dirt to keep her belly full. They also experienced racism with you know the, the nationalism where since they knew their uncle was in Hong Kong that they were kind of oppressed and uh she was kind of went into this life where she raised kids as a young girl and and was forced to sleep under the the stairs cupboard like like harry potter and but not magical at all <laughs> <laughs> and uh eventually she escaped to hong kong where she was you know became became this man's uh wife and that's where they had jack and she said she was heartbroken to see her grandmother's eyes, her, her her hair on Jack, but him kind of reject it and look at her with such hate. She never understood why, but wanted to, to love him nonetheless. Yeah, it's a tearjerker for sure. It's All right, so let's go into our discussion. So we've got four prompts to jump through here. And Dean is going to go through the same prompts on her channel. So please check out her channel. She does science fiction on the regular. Question number <laughs> one, talk about the cultural differences the characters experienced. Yeah, I think this is really important to the relationship of the mother and the son and how the boy being raised in America really attaches to his American identity and heritage over his his Asian at that. And I think that it starts at this young age and it all comes down to the action figure in my mind. He's so enamored with, I think, his, you know, non 
Chinese friends. And for some reason, and it never really explains it explicitly why he sees that as superior over his his Chinese heritage. I, I think it's because he's getting rejected by by his cohorts, right? We saw like this just the neighbors with how how racist they were, they said, Something about the mixing never seems right. The child looks unfinished, slanty eyes, white face, a little monster. And that can be hard to hear, I think, as a young child, right? You want to fit in. You want to have friends. And he's being rejected for something that he... Like, he doesn't make a choice to look this way. This is him. This is his heritage. And to be rejected, I think, is really hard because it's not even what you choose to be. It's 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 just something that's inherent into you, and it shows intolerance. And I mean, America's a very intolerant society. We're extremely racist in this country, right? Yeah. So for this boy to re- to be rejected for who he is, the only thing he can do is try to disassociate any connection he has with that culture, which is kind of what he goes through with his mom. He tries to assimilate her into, why don't you cook American? Why don't, why don't you hug me the right way? Like He changes her to be the culture that allows him to fit in, kind of. And this really surprises me, too, uh, because of where the story is set. A lot of times, you know, regionally in our country, sometimes, you know, race is accepted a little bit more. Uh, People are a little bit more tolerant in certain areas, not entirely. And again, we're not trying to judge specific people. A lot of times there are accepting people of this. And, uh, you know, the father, you know, he he has to be somewhat accepting of Asian, you know, culture, you know, he married, uh, you know, a woman from there, and he never really sticks up for his son or, you know, uh, and again, I know that's part of the story, but that's something that I feel kind of is a knock towards our society a little bit because there are good people. There are, uh, you know, it's just showing that children sometimes aren't. But that kind of hurts my heart a little bit, too, because it's taught, you know, it's beyond just American versus Chinese because we saw the origami and the toy scene. Right. Yeah. We see the tiger and the crow. Right. And once the tiger's injured by the crow, he never wants to go play. And he's he not, he's never the same again, the same way that kids can be injured once once they're hurt in this way, kind of like what we were just talking about. And you even have the China and the Hong Kong experience from the mom in that backstory, too, that this isn't just America versus Chinese. This is when two things are different. How do they clash? And I think uh, another way that I wanted to kind of bring this up was the husband and wife relationship. And when the dad saw the mom, we have this quote, she looked out at him with the eyes of a calm child. That's from the how he describes seeing her in the magazine, that he that she was looking at him with the eyes of a calm child. How did you take that? A little bit scary. Uh, I feel like the dad is very judgmental, but distant uh, uh, towards the, the wife. I'm going to point out that this entire story is narrated by the little boy. This isn't technically the dad's story, right? We're told it's his story, but it's really going through the boy's filter. This is kind of unreliable because the boy saying like, oh, my dad took in this liar of a woman. My dad brought her into this family. He's kind of putting a spin on it. And I feel like, and I wonder, I think this is actually really smart if he did it this way, is his first memory was how she was able to console him. What if this is him projecting onto her into this story that she was looking at her dad with the eyes of a calm child, like the same way his first memory is of him being calmed down from the mom. I don't know if that's the way he meant it, but I think that's an interesting way to kind of look at this scene. And it's an interesting way to look at this memory, that this is being told through the filter of this boy who is starting to reject his Chinese heritage, right? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that, that's a good way. But I think that's what sets up the ending twist, which which hurt, which hit me pretty hard, because it sets up that cultural blindness when it's going through the boy's eyes. Because to your point, the dad has to be somewhat more open or, or maybe he was looking for something. It's never explained. But there has to be something different there that when you explore it through his eyes, the cultural blindness is what allows that twist at the end, I feel like. It, that, that sets up this whole story. And I think that's really important to talk about is that this is a, a filtered story of through, through the boy. Okay. Let's go on to question two. Talk about empathy in the story. So let's start off with a definition. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And I think that share the feelings is the important part to understand the difference between this and sympathy, right? Like you see those cards where sympathy is saying, like, I'm sorry for your loss. Empathy is where, like, 
they're not saying anything, but he's got his arm around her and they're both crying, right? It's it's sharing the emotion of yeah. the time. I think this really comes down to the relationship between the mom and the son and the father, it, uh, all three, because the mom is able to connect with the son in his young age because she has suffered and the boy is suffering and she can empathize with him, share those feelings with him and try to make it better. And the father doesn't have that ability because he might not have the same life experiences because he didn't go through what the mom went through. And so he kind of just blows it off. I also think it's a little bit, you know, throwing in there maybe that sexism that the mom is the caregiver and the nurturer and the father Mm -hmm. is, you know, not uh, he's not able to. Uh, he's disassociated with his own feelings, and so he can't be burdened with that. Am I wrong here? We never got the dad or the mom's name, did we? No, I don't remember getting the mom or dad's names. Just Jack. I could be way off here. Maybe it was dropped and I missed it. But isn't that also a way to show that since this is going through the boy's narration, he never connected with either one of them, really, did he? I mean, there's even, like I think, a line there where they say, I never really knew my dad either. Yeah. No, I, I think that he is very self-centered, the child, and he doesn't connect with his mom. He connects partially with his mom for a little while, and then when it doesn't suit him, you know, he kind of banishes her, and then he, you know, just kind of uses his dad, and then his dad is trying to fix things, I guess, with the family, the mom and the, and Jack at the end, and the son's like, no, nah, I, I got to go for this interview. You know, I, I my job and career is more important, yeah. and he yeah. can't empathize back. And maybe it's because the dad never helped teach that. I mean, well, isn't it interesting too? The only way she could communicate was in, was was through nonverbal cues, through empathy, even with how she tried to soothe him. They tried to res- relate to him, maybe her more so than the dad. I don't know if we have any dad examples, but they she at least tried to empathize with him that the boy didn't until much later that he realized. Or at least I realized the mistakes that I made, uh, that he made. No, I think that they the, the the story is all about the relationship of the mother and the son and their their cultural empathy for one another and the misses of it of two. Uh, and I think the dad is definitely a major secondary character here. There's arguably a line there too about the dad uh, paying the wait waitress to translate for them. We don't know much about the dad's desires or like, like the philosophies really aren't worked out in the story. But you can see him making an effort to try to relate to her at some point, too. Let's go to question number three. Talk about tradition and translation in the story. So we'll start with origami. Do you know the history of origami? Uh, No, I don't actually know it all that well. Uh, It's a symbology of passing down uh, the history and the meaning of, I think, life in different uh, Chinese culture, right? I don't think anyone can tell you the complete history of origami. There's arguments and, and, and research that shows a lot of different ways. But to your point, it's mostly oral. It's mostly passed down generation to generation. And that's kind of an underlying theme of this story. Once you get kind of the backstory from the mom, you learn that she learned it from her mom. The, the, the boy's, Jack's grandmother taught his mom the origami. And she tried to use origami to pass on to him. Going back to the Question one about uh, passing down cultures and values, origami and this this tradition is something that she's trying to kind of like pass down and is very representative of that because I think in the beginning, the boy is open to cultures, right? And that's when he's consoled, he's accepting, he plays with these origami. But then what happens when he starts to turn into a 10-year-old and thusly a teenager, right? He rejects he, it. Yeah. He starts, well, they even say the tiger became more tattered and torn. So I want to talk about the symbolism of origami here because the mom was passing things down from her culture. We have this quote, I didn't know this at the time, but mom's kind was special. She breathed into them so that they shared her breath and thus moved with her life. This was her magic. I think the origami represents a lot of the relationship between them, right? And as he pushes his mother away, he also pushes his origami away, and he throws her away and says, don't touch me. He throws his origami in the attic, and, you know, he attaches more to his, you know, American identity with, you know, getting the Star Wars dolls and slowly moving away from his his mother. Well, even before that, I have a quote I want to share with you. I'm curious if you read into this much. But there is the... Um, water buffalo where it says sometimes the animals got into trouble 
Once the water buffalo jumped into a dish of soy sauce on the table at dinner. He wanted to wallow like a real water buffalo. Did you take anything from that? No, I just thought it was funny because I'm just imagining, you know, the the little creature in there, uh, you know, and then it says about him soaking up the stuff and, uh, you know, falling over and they had to repair him. This is injected right in between all these 10 year old scenes when he has the neighbors that are like, he seems different. He doesn't act. He doesn't look. He looks like he looks like a monster. Right. And you have the little boy that's like, why do you do things these Chinese ways? You know, and he's he's seeing a lot of racist things. And he learned to reject her through the neighbors and the way that the the people would scowl at him and make fun of his Chinese heritage, if you will. And this is the boy that wants to act like a real American. He wants to be the water buffalo that acts like a real water buffalo. He's trying to fit in and act like others in the same way that this water buffalo was going through a destructive behavior of going into the soy sauce in the same way that this boy does of being destructive of pushing his family away. There's a lot of little nuances here about how two different things can clash. And that might sound crazy at first, but think about it too from the the tiger's perspective when it fought with the crow and how the crow damaged it. And it took a while to the point where he said he never wanted to play with that crow again after that, like since since the crow was much different. There's a lot of just dis very subtle ways that he kind of played with two different ideals clashing against each other. No, yeah, the story is beautifully written. I mean, there's no wonder that why he won awards for this. So the origami are very clearly the traditions that are being passed down. And his the way that he treats it is very symbolic of his relationship with his mom and, and his his past, if you will. All right, so let's move on to the last prompt where we talk about fantasy and sci-fi element of the story. And is magic real in this story or not? So what was your takeaway? I don't know if it matters. I know that's totally like a cheat answer. But I think the whole point of this magic. So so we had that quote. Yeah. She breathed into them so that they shared her breath and thus moved with her life. That was her magic. I took this as, I think there's a lot of different ways you can take this, but I think this speaks to how the origami are representing the passing down of traditions of her culture, of her life to, to her son. You can think of it as her breathing magic into the origami is, is symbolic of the magic that that parents give life to us. They, they teach us our values. They teach us our traditions. They try to steer us to be tolerant and respectful individuals. And if we turn that away, if we squash it, we squash it like the way they, they did in this origami, you can kind of turn away from that magic that your parents gave you. And I think that's kind of how I took kind of the science fiction. It's it's the magic in the ordinary events and moments that we have as interactions with our parents and with us culturally different individuals to experience that. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. So my thing with the sci-fi is, is the sci-fi necessary for the story? Is it a, a, a plot device? Does it need to be there? And in this one, I kind of go back and forth. Uh, at some points, I think that the story could happen without it, because if the magic is not real, uh, does the story still happen? Yes. But I think that the magic there explains a lot of the relationship, as you said, of parents giving us life, as she gave the origami life, she gave life to Jack. And I think that at the end of the story, when the mom is gone, it doesn't matter that she's dead, that her life still lives on through Jack. And Mm -hmm. that when our parents are gone, you miss them, but they still live on in you. And that we pass down hopefully the best parts of us because we want a better life for our children. And that's what she wanted. She wanted a better life for Jack. And that's why she made sacrifices all her life and gave up who she was basically for him. And I think that that's the true magic here. Whether the origami was alive or not, I don't know. I I tend to think no, because I think the true magic is love here. Uh, Understanding, acceptance, and sacrifice is the true magic of this story. So, I don't know. The only argument I I think I could make for the origami being truly alive is when the boy gets hurt. Uh, How did that happen? Did did Jack actually hurt him? Because I think that if that happened, the parent would have been over there upset. Your kid beat up my kid or something over a toy. Uh, well, I mean, it could be as something as, as Jack was holding the tiger. And when he went to go play at, play at his friend, he accidentally smashed, smacked his friend or something. I mean, it could be sim- something as simple as that. It isn't, it isn't written that way. It says he sets it down and it runs on the table and jumps up at him. 
But does it not also say that the memories of childs are so unreliable? That's true. And we, we've made the argument that his memory projects itself into maybe the way the dad's story talked about how he met his mom and such, too. I mean, the, but, ar- I, but the, argu- a, the argument's there. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. But as a child, is magic real? Oh, yeah. Believing is seeing. Seeing yeah. is believing. I mean, yeah. I, I think that I think magic could be real as a kid. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, I, I actually thought you were going to go to a different route. Did it rub <laughs> you at all when they talked about the capillary action with the buffalo? No. I must have missed that. There's nothing wrong with it. So I'm not saying this is a technical fundamental issue, but it just kind of brought me out a little bit of the story. My cat's having a hairball. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So it, It's it, having capillary action. <laughs> <laughs> it brought me a little bit out of the story when they started to talk about the capillary action of the water going up the water buffalo. But I couldn't help but wonder, I'm like, okay, well, is this, like a lot of times science fiction tries to predict or teach you things a lot of the times that, you know, is this a subtle way to kind of be like, oh, I wonder what capillary is and go like look it up or whatever. So I, I kind of wrote it off, but that, that line kind of stood out. I'm curious, if, okay, it didn't bug you. I'm curious if anyone out on the internet who's listening to this video right now, let me know in the comments down below when you ran into that line about the capillary action, did you just gloss over it and you're like, okay, cool, whatever? Or were you like, well, why, why would they say that? Like, I don't know. It kind of, just why it was there was this kind of like very science fiction I guess. Well, I guess I could take us into our very subjective view of the story here as we kind of move to the end of the video. Um, why do you focus so much on that? You know, that why did that pull you out when I felt like that was kind of positive, I felt, of the story because it's so damn sad. Uh, the whole story, that was kind of the only time I felt like uplifted a little bit was that funny little part where I could imagine the mom sitting there and the kids sitting there and, you know, the buffalo jumping in the sauce and it's splashing and they're giggling and laughing at each other. And then he's like, oh, no, mom. And, you know, the, the it's mm-hmm. sinking, you know, because the liquid's rising up its legs because it's absorbing into the paper. And, you know, and I could see this thing where she's like, I can fix it. I can fix it. And there's this very tender moment between them. I felt like that was one of the only things that I was really able to grasp onto well, let's let's put it this way. I think I think what you are describe how I would describe what you're describing is so they described it as AI, i.e. in Japanese. That that means love, I believe in Japanese, and it sounds like it means the same thing in in, in Chinese. One of the ways that I describe love is doing things selflessly for others. If if I'm doing it for the intent of making my wife happy, I think that's one way to describe love. It's in these moments when he's trying to save the animals and save the buffaloes. It's one of the few moments where Jack's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about others, helping others, even if it is the symbolic representations of his mother's love for him. Those are one of the few moments where we see Jack not be such a prick to his mom that those, of course, are going to be the happy moments in the story, right? Yeah, but you harped on the the capillaries instead of just enjoying this one positive moment out of a very sad story. I enjoyed the moment. I just wondered why. Okay, you did. Because in my opinion... Unless capillary and the idea of the scientific action of the 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 magnetism that brings closely connected water or liquids up because of the magnetism of the molecules matters, you should have just said absorbed or it's, it doesn't it doesn't make sense for me to use the word capillary there because it becomes more. Um, so this has happened while you were reading it. Exactly, kind of what happened right here. Yeah, so that I'm, pulled I'm, you out of the story. I'm okay. thinking about it more so than experiencing, because this has been a very experiential story. This was yeah. a very cognitive moment, which I thought was kind of interesting. But I'm like, maybe this is just the science fiction part of things. I guess okay. I don't know. Okay. So, so what's your rating? Uh, I'm gonna give it a solid eight. Bam. I'm gonna go with a nine point five because I cried. What, I, yeah. What, what else am I gonna do? If, if you make me cry, I'm going to go with a 9.5 because I obviously care. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. That's that's incredible. I, I'm not, you know me, I'm not in touch with my emotions. I'm not a crier, no. My wife right. says she probably could diagnose me for that reason, but. <laughs> right, you probably you probably wanted to see Jack, you know, let loose a little bit and start picking on some people. You probably would have liked that a little bit. No. <laughs> Jack, Jack is a jerk. I wanted him to, I wanted him to cry and be like, oh my gosh, I'm a terrible person and I, didn't even say goodbye to my dying mother. Well, this goes back to that, like our discussion from the the poetics from Aristotle. This is catharsis. When you have a character that does bad things, you need to purge them out. 
This is him realizing the mistake, the tragic error in his character flaw is how he made these mistakes. You get to see him finally, I believe, reconcile or accept that he made a mistake, I think is what we're, we're meant to assume from this. Yeah, when he walks away with uh, the tiger, you know, nestled in his arm and it's, quote, still alive, uh, I think that's him finally accepting his his heritage and maybe hopefully going to be a better person. Putting, putting the love back into his mother's memory. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys. Thank you so much for discussing this piece with us. What, what did you guys think? Uh, definitely a good piece. We'll, we'll give you our recommendations in the wrap-up. But uh, please consider subscribing for more literature discussions. I know this was science fiction and a little bit out of what we do normally, but I believe there was enough literary value here that it was definitely worth discussing and bringing the story to people's attention because I think it's worth your time. Yeah, amazing story. Go check out Dini's rendition too, and please subscribe. Peace, Peace. out.